audience? Is that where we are? And to all of those at home, uh, thank you for, for tuning in. I think that sometimes we don't uh, remind ourselves enough about who, who those people are out there. So thank you uh, for participating in our worship with us today. It's always weird uh, for me when I'm speaking. I don't, I don't write a lot of, of notes. You, you won't see me reading anything here today. I just wander around the house building paragraphs mentally. Stitch them all together and then I tear them apart right there 30 minutes before the, the sermon starts. And then there's that one moment while we're singing where, where your mind goes blank. And so you walk up here and it's like walking into a test. And you I don't know anything. And so <clears throat> you, know, you just try to get the first question right, name which is tough for me in, the, in particular. But, so my name is Ray. Uh, and with that, I think we can take the test and we can begin. So our series is on how Jesus changes us. And we've been looking at that for a little while now. We've talked about some broad topics and some things in particular. But given that it's the holiday season, and, and I think we have started it, if we're not knee-deep into it, we soon will be. This is Thanksgiving week, uh, and then it's going to move very quickly on into Christmas. I thought that we'd look at peace. Now, peace is a wonderful thing, right? It's one of those things that when you have it, you almost always take it for granted and ignore it. And once you lose it, your entire life can be spent scrambling desperately to regain it. And we go in and out of that situation in our lives like a heartbeat. And there is, there is nothing we can do about that. But as a Christian, I think that peace is a little different than how the world understands it. And so we're going to look at how the world looks at peace, then we're going to look at how a Christian should look at peace. And then we're going to leave you with that, and, and you can use that to you know, determine every day of the rest of your life. So, we'll start with John 14, 7. This is from... The Last Supper, or that period there, the discourse in the upper room, and Jesus is talking to the disciples. Now, he's, he's laid some very heavy things at their feet earlier in the evening. He's talked about his death in a way that's definitive, and he tells them that it will be this night. He has told Peter, you will betray me three times. He has chastised no fewer than two of the disciples in other conversations about misunderstandings they have about what his work means and how it's going to go down and whether or not they can come with or whether they have to wait and stay and do their part of the work. Uh, and then there's that entire uh, part that's you know, covered on with that. And this is one of Jesus' final sayings to the disciples. If I had to tell you all of those things tonight, if you had to tell your family all of those type of things tonight, I will leave you tonight. It is our last night together. What would you try to leave them with at the end? A small bit of comfort? And this is what the Lord is doing. And he tells them, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Now we all know what happens over the next 72 hours. In fact, one, one after another, they, they, all of the disciples are troubled. They are afraid. Uh, they all do the things that the Lord had said they were going to do. Because despite being told exactly how these next few days would play out, they don't yet have that mountain of faith. It's coming. Christ has told them twice this night the Holy Spirit will come. And that one of its specific purposes is to give them confidence in their faith in the resurrection and to help them remember so that we can have the, the Bible that we have today. Now I give that to you for the younger children, although we discovered there aren't very many of them here today, but because we're not having class this morning, so this is your memory verse. There'll be a couple of other verses uh, in the lesson, but this is the one you have to remember. This is the one you'll be tested on throughout your life as you try to find your peace, or as you try to maintain your peace. Now, I think the world sees three types, two types of peace, really. We see three. First is peace on earth. 
and peace between men. I should say peace among men. That's how I rewrote it right there, but I didn't have enough time to get up here and click at it. It just sounded more King Jamesian, but. And then peace with God, which is what we understand as bringing peace in our lives. And so I thought we'd look at the first two, talk about the third one, uh, and then move on forward uh, with our lives. So, peace on earth. You think there is any? I don't really think so. I think this is Ecclesiastes 3, right? A time for, and, and it, it's funny, in, in our Bibles it says a time for everything, one word. I think it should be everything. Now, that's, that's not the scripture part. That's the part somebody else has written in to help us get through chapters and verses. All of these things are going to happen, right? War, peace, in, in the sense that man thinks of peace when we talk about peace on earth. Famine, misfortune, love, hate, life, dying, all of these things go on. But in regards to peace on earth, I think that man thinks that it's one of those two verses right there. Really, they talk about the first one, Luke 2.14. That's the first. I, I put two versions up there for a reason. We'll touch that here uh, briefly uh, very soon. So this is the holiday season, right? This is the time of year where for at least the next 45 to 50 days, mankind pretends that he gets along with each other. I appreciate the sentiment. I really do. I look forward to this time of year every year uh, because at least they're trying. Imagine if we just eliminated that part of the year and we just stayed at what we do every day which is get after the business of, of hurting each other. And so I think that man thinks peace on earth means peace amongst our nations, amongst our tribes, amongst our groupings of individuals uh, with no conflict. And that's, that's why they take Luke 2.14 and they, and they say that, peace on earth, goodwill towards men. Now in, in some of the other versions you'll see, uh, they change that a little bit so that it says... Uh, on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. Both are correct. Man thinks these verses are about man. And that him bringing about some form of peace on earth. And him practicing goodwill toward men. And that's where we make the mistake. These verses are the announcement by the heavenly host, specifically related to the birth of Christ. And nothing else. No other topic is valid. And so what they are saying is, this gift to God, this Messiah, or gift from God, this Messiah will bring about peace on earth. We'll talk about that in the very last one. That's God's peace. And that his very birth is a gift of goodwill toward men. The culmination of how many thousands of years of God striving to get us straight in our relationship with him. And it's happened. And, and heaven itself cannot contain its joy. And so they're talking to the shepherds, and suddenly these angels burst forth into view in the sky, and it's called the Annunciation because that's what they're announcing, the birth of Jesus. <clears throat> and they have to tell the world what it means. And man straightway confuses it and thinks it's about him because that's what man does. We think everything is about us, right? And that's why there can be no peace between nations, tribes, affiliations. We've been fighting as long as the world has existed. And that will never end. And that is Matthew 24, 6. As long as there are wars and rumors of wars, see to it you're not alarmed. That's sort of the, the, the natural state of man. As a tribe, we just cannot wait to come over the hill at each other. So what about peace among men? Peace between men. That's the second part I think that man likes to consider. And it's a little bit different. But do we have it? So I think there's three kind of people, we're, we're, we're three kind of pieces we're talking about here. Just general peace between any two people wandering the world. Peace between 
Gentiles and Christians, and then even peace amongst ourselves as Christians. Amongst any of those groups, can you find peace? I don't know. It's tough. You, you look at the world and man lives to argue, right? It's what we do. We choose some ground, we call it sacred as a topic, and, and we'll brook no disagreement or interference over it. It's a large part of what's going on in our own country today. We've even lost the ability to constructively argue with each other. But you need to, and it needs to be okay. We can disagree to disagree. And there's no real peace between us and non-believers. Christ promises you that. It's a gift from him. They will hate you as they hate me. They will hate you for loving me. But we have no peace there. And even amongst ourselves, do we, do we ever not argue? I think that not a year has gone by to where there hasn't been some disagreement between at least two people in this congregation. We stake our ground and then we hold on to our positions or, or we, we are triggered. Now James talks about that. And James, of course, is talking to us about us. And he says, this is your fault. Whenever you are in an argument with anyone, it is your fault. Own it. You have chosen to be there. You're actively participating in the disagreement. And it is on you. And that, I think, is the key. Once we learn to own ourselves, we can move very far forward very quickly in our relationship with God. Honestly about who and what we are. But that's a key first step. Admitting you're a sinner, sort of like step 0.05 to becoming a Christian. First we have to admit who we are and what our faults are. But we don't do that in, in our discussions with ourselves for some reason. And it's especially troubling now, right? We, we've, we've all been through um, our recent times. And of course we're talking about this pandemic that we've got going on. I think that there might have only been two times in all of recorded history in which there was truly peace among men. One was in the garden before we decided that we wanted to eat a forbidden piece of fruit for lunch. Because it was just Adam and Eve, right? Wandering around every day in awe of the creation that they had been placed in, doing the things they were told to do. And they didn't even understand what it meant to have a disagreement. They didn't even have those concepts and thoughts. There were no impolite comments. There, there was none of that. And so I, I think that that one is pretty, pretty certain. The second one possibly would be in the ark in the first couple of weeks when there's only six people left. Now I say possibly because we've all been through some form of isolation and or quarantine here recently. And how long does that good thing last before you're just looking at somebody going... I, I said forever, I said till death do us part, but man, that last part's getting closer every time you open your mouth. <laughs> it happens, right? We, we rub up on each other, you know, all those little things that we forgive every single day suddenly become arguable over. And that's us, that, that's the person that I love most in life. How much more so for a random stranger whom I'm supposed to be displaying this love of Christ to every day for everything that I do. And so I think that peace among men is a myth, and I think it's okay. Because that's not what God promised. That wasn't even his intent. If you give someone free will, they've got to be free to do whatever they want. And then you place knowledge of good and evil in their hands or have placed in their hands. And you have to accept that they may choose to do wrong. So 
Sometimes that's how we learn, right? I don't know how you learn not to put forks in a light socket, but I was, I was a hands-on, practical application kind of kid. And so somebody said, don't stick things in the outlet. I grabbed things and stuck them in outlets until I was certain that every outlet delivered the same shot. <laughs> and it might have took every outlet in the house because I was certain there was, the, there was one that would not. Same with a hot stove, right? People say, don't touch that, it's hot. What's hot? Touch that, you'll find out. So, we are free to make our own choices and decisions. Our task as Christians is to make sure that we do them right. And that's why I think that we have to understand peace differently than any other people in all the world. Because God's not talking about the first two. We've seen some verses where he promises that those two will not come about. And so I'm not surprised that man immediately gravitated towards those and said, those are my goal. It's what man does, right? Left to his own devices, he floats farther away from God than closer. So I think it's this. And and Fred, I'm wandering away from the podium. I'm sorry. Fred's out there somewhere watching me right now. That was was his, his, and I love Fred because he gave me these corrections. You know, he's honest with me about our performance here in the congregation. And he said, he said very politely, and if you know Fred, you can imagine how Fred says things much nicer than Ray Fuller does. He says, stop walking around and just stay at the podium so I can hear you. So, (laughs) we're going to see if we can stay here. So how does God want us to understand peace? God wants us to understand peace as an acceptance. An acceptance of all those things that happen in the world. It's okay. It's okay because we have faith in God. Faith in his son, in who he said he was. Faith in the completion of his work, in his resurrection, and in the promise of what that means for us. And if we are focused on that, then it's very easy to get along with our daily lives here to include all of the distractions and problems that we may have as a part of that. And that's why he says, don't be troubled and don't be afraid. Now, if you're scared, say you're scared. That's what I tell people all the time, especially when they're in a life and death situation. It's okay, we're all scared. Don't let it stop you from doing what you got to do. Because we're supposed to have a calm assurance about our lives and about our future. How much of this life is eternity? If it were a ruler, and the ruler covered from the beginning to the absolute end, you wouldn't even show up on the left side. That's how big the scales of time would have to be. Forever is forever, and our lives are such a small amount of time. I should say our lives here, right? Because I'm, I'm going someplace. And I believe you believe so too. What I just said was I think you believe I'm going. I don't know about you. The jury's still out. But I think it's easy for us to have that, that assurance if we know and understand the life and purpose of Christ's birth, his teachings, his death, and why that had to happen, and his resurrection. And the validation that that is for all of the promises that he made for us concerning our relationship with God. And I think that that is is the difference. We We can have our disagreements. It's okay. We can work through them politely, professionally, as I tell people at work. We're allowed to have, there, there, are, there is conflict on this earth. I don't, as, a, as a junior level historian, I don't think there's ever been a time in which man was not at war somewhere on this earth. Those things will happen. There will be bad news. There is bad news now in your life and there will be bad news in the future. 
We will lose loved ones. We will have bad things happen to us. But what does this life matter when what is at stake is your soul with the Lord? So I think those are the, those are the ways, or that is the way, uh, that we have to understand peace with God. Peace of God. Either way you want to say it. And it's, it's hard to master. I have not. If anyone thinks they have, please come see me. I need your instruction. Because I find myself every day running into situations where I become frustrated, I become angry. I want to lay hands on people. You know, I'm, I'm sort of a hands-on kind of faith healer guy. It's like, you had a problem. There you go, I fixed it. <laughs> Ta-da! But what we have to learn is to move through those positions in order to be the example that I think the Bible asks us to become. Doesn't mean that we have to sit on, on, a, on a mountaintop somewhere, you know, with hands in a triangle, you know, saying, oh, all the time. That's not peace with God. Really. I'm not even sure if that constitutes inner peace, uh, because those, per, those people can be disrupted just like the rest of us. What God is looking for is someone who can live their life every day, resting on faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of his son and all of the things that he promised us as we move through our lives. Because it's not the first two. If you're looking for the first two, you're going to be sadly disappointed every day of the rest of your life. It's just the way it is. Man will disappoint you. You will disappoint others if you want to make it personal. Our grace under pressure is to rest on an understanding and a love and a belief in our faith which God will reward. If you die for your faith, <clears throat> and there are a lot of things you can claim faith in, if you die for your faith and it's anything other than the Lord's, good luck with that. You might be remembered as a footnote in history for as long as the people who are fighting that fight remain. But when they fade away, so will you in all knowledge of you. Can you name anyone who built the pyramid? Well, we lost the list of workers so long ago, they weren't even deemed important. Even our war heroes that we reward are forgotten over time. They have there are countries that have come into existence and faded away that we have never even heard of. Because that's all here on this world. But Christ says, no greater love hath any man than to give his life for another. And that's what he did for us. As a demonstration and as a proof text, how can you refute that? And then what he says is, believe that. And if you believe that, believe everything I said. I think how Luke said it several weeks ago, is apt. If that is true, it's all true. And if it's all true, then behave like it's true. Behave accordingly. Believe in it. Put your faith in it. Rest on it. Let that, let that be your foundation in all of the things you do. And in the end, you'll get to see me. because that, That's where I plan on being. I'm not going to work in their bureaucracy, so I won't be checking people's passports at the gate. But I might just give you a flying tackle hug when you pass through that station and you enter in. Because it's a race for me. I can't wait to be there. I'm not looking forward to the day I die, but I'm unafraid. And I'm going to go gladly. There are some people there I want to see. I would very much love to see all of you there, too. I would love to see everyone out there in the world there. And in order to make that happen, we're supposed to tell them about Christ. Show them our peace. 
Show them our understanding. Show them our faith. Show them our love. And that will provide them the opportunity to ask, who are you and what have you done with Ray Fuller? That's what they'll ask me. If they ask you that question, then at least tell them you know me and then point them over my way. Our task and purpose is to introduce people to Christ. Now, we, if you want some of that peace in your personal life, and you're not yet a Christian, we always offer the opportunity to become one right here every Sunday morning uh, as a part of our worship. Uh, you can claim Christ as your Savior. Uh, you can ask for forgiveness of your sins. We can put you in the water. You can be baptized in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Uh, and you can start to make those changes in your life. Or, if you are a Christian and there's anything at all that you need that we can help with, we provide that opportunity. Likewise, as we stand and we sing.